Welcome to this week's Into the Wilderness podcast. I am your host, Byron Pace. It is the 30th of April, 2020. In this show, we are tackling a massively controversial topic head on. One that is globally relevant and particularly pertinent in the UK right now as we await the outcome from the recent DEFRA consultation to restrict the import of trophies from hunting. This is a topic which we will likely revisit, but as a starting point, I wanted to deliver a discussion which was as impartial and scientifically astute as possible. So that's what we've done here. This is Trophy Hunting with a Scientist. I want to introduce you to Adam Hart. He is a professor of science communication at Gloucester University, and we will get into a bit of his background right at the start of the show. But before we get into that, Thank you, as always, to the Patreon supporters. You have made it entirely possible for us to release these new shorts, which I'm just finding a rhythm for now, so I think this is how it's going to work. We have these standard, long-form interviews, which we've always delivered out every two weeks on a Thursday. I will follow that with an Into the Wilderness short, really digging into the science of a very particular topic. Then you will be back to the long-form interview, and then the following week, we're going to do the the behind-the-lens short show, where we look at the the behind-the-scenes stories of particularly iconic images. So as always, a big shout-out to our top-tier supporters on Patreon, who include this week Richard Stevens, Richard McNeil, Ronnie Speakman of rdcontracting.co.uk, Chris Griffith, John Henry Peat, Tom McCraith, James Benjamin Normandale, James Marchington, the guys at South Esher Stalking, Josh Starling, Sean Rowan, James Alban Corbin, and Thomas Cameron. Thank you very much to all of you. If you would like to support us on Patreon, head over to patreon.com forward slash Pace Brothers. We have a winner from the competition that we ran two weeks ago to win a copy of Modern Huntsman. Of course, Modern Huntsman are our partners on this podcast, and you've been hearing a lot from them in the last couple of weeks because we've been bringing uh, some short shows which have really been focused on what Modern Huntsman have been up to. And as of... The day before this podcast goes out, the front cover of Volume 5 has finally dropped. So head over to the Modern Huntsman website or Modern Huntsman on Instagram. And in fact, I'm actually even going to put it up on our Instagram if you want to see what the front cover of Volume 5, which is all focused on traditions, looks like. It's amazing. So anyway, two weeks ago, I asked you to just simply share the show, share the show on social and and with friends. And I randomly selected Phil Whitting. Congratulations, Phil. You are the winner. You shared, I think you shared the show on Facebook. So thank you very much for that. You win a copy of Modern Huntsman, whichever volume you want. Just reach back out to me and we will get a copy to you. We have a discount code for our podcast listeners for all Modern Huntsman items. So if you go over to thepacebrothers.com, click shop, look at the category Modern Huntsman, you can get 15% off anything in there if you use the discount code into the wilderness on checkout. New competition for this show, and it's a super simple one. Uh, Everyone who is on our Patreon list as of the show, which comes out in two weeks' time, uh, will be in with a chance of winning your choice of a volume of Modern Huntsman. I'll just randomly select somebody on the list of people who support on Patreon. It's not something we do very often because I know that that excludes some people, and I I like to be as inclusive as possible, but every now and then I think it's just an extra thank you to those people who help support the show. And in two weeks' time, we'll have another chance to win a copy of Modern Huntsman open to absolutely everyone for for nothing, just normally just a share or uh, sometimes a review. Now we are done with all that. Let's get into the show. Here is an extract from UK parliamentary questions, first raising the issue of trophy imports. The first voice you will hear is Zach Goldsmith, who at the time was a member of parliament and minister for the environment. He since lost his seat at the last election, but has been made a life peer, so he's still involved in this process. The second voice you hear is Michael Gove. In many ways, the UK has led the agenda on wildlife protection. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that we would enhance that reputation if like France, the Netherlands and Australia, we banned the import of so-called hunting trophies. 
Well, I have a lot of sympathy with what um, uh, my honourable friend says. Um, I find the idea of trophy hunting um, a, a, a difficult one to contemplate as anyone's idea of um, a wise use of time or resources. However, it is the case that uh, the current regime allows trophies to be imported provided there is no impact on the sustainability of species. We keep these rules constantly under review and I'm grateful, I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman, to members across this House and to NGOs for keeping a spotlight on this issue because it is an issue that troubles many of us. OK, with the scene set, let's meet Professor Adam Hart. I know we don't have a massive amount of time today, uh, so there's a, a few things that I wanted to particularly cover. But I think in order to give the sort of appropriate weight to the conversation that we're going to have, the best place for us to start is for you just to give us a, a quick overview of your background. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you're an entomologist, but you've also yeah, massive... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but you're, you're, you're big into science communication. I see that from a lot of your social feeds. Uh, you're a presenter on, on the BBC uh, you write for a lot of different publications. Uh, you seem to wear quite a few hats. Uh, so what is your, your background and education to the position that you're in now, which I, uh, you're a professor at Gloucester University? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I'm professor of science communication at the University of Gloucestershire. And that's that's a sort of uh, a ragtag role in a way because it covers, as you say, an awful lot of different different things. My my main research interest actually when I when I did my PhD, which is about 20 years ago now, was social insects. So, And I still maintain an interest in those. So I, I studied leaf cutting ants actually in Central and South America and honeybees and so on. Um, but I've always been very, very interested in ecology in the round. So not just specific creatures, but actually interactions between them and how all that kind of works. And you know, during those early years, sort of beginning of, of 2000, I actually took my first trip to Africa. A friend of mine's family owned um, a property in Zambia and spent a lot of time traveling around in Malawi and Zambia. We, we ducked into Zimbabwe for a little bit too. Uh, and since then, I've actually been going back to Africa, particularly South Africa and Southern Africa. So South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, um, quite extensively, actually. And, and that's really been, been sort of my general interest in wildlife and ecology. So I, I don't like to sort of be uh, pigeonholed really as an entomologist. Um, if, if you've got an insect you're not sure how to id i'm probably not the best person to come to i can i can give it a stab right but i can give it a go but but actually um you know i'm much more interested in sort of how all these things interact so I, i've had quite a, a developing interest in in african ecology particularly and, and over the last sort of eight to ten years um as a consequence really of taking a field course down to down to south africa um, I've become much more interested in things like conservation management. So I'm involved in a, a big research program now based in, in South Africa, where we look at how you manage particularly fenced reserves, which is uh, um, uh, what, what the case is for a lot of uh, wildlife land in South Africa, how, how you manage those in terms of keeping the grass healthy, how you manage them in terms of parasites, for example, for the animals that live on there. So I've sort of branched out, I guess. And, and during that process um, over the last 20 years and particularly over the last 10 um, I've become interested in in conservation hunting in in the role of trophy hunting as, as a sort of shorthand for that in conservation you know I, st I started off actually the first time I came across this was was in Zambia and I was um, I was kind of uh, <laughs> amazed I'm not really sure what the right word for it really was I, I had no idea this happened and you know, bear in mind I, I did an undergraduate degree in zoology at Cambridge I studied conservation biology I'm very interested in a lot of these things and you know have been ever since I can remember you know I was watching Attenborough documentaries and reading magazines about wildlife I'd never come across this and and to then sort of see that you know as it was in Zambia and and, and suddenly sort of realized that this happened was quite an epiphany for me really and that begun uh, a long period of sort of I guess coming to terms with the fact that conservation wasn't what I had been led to believe that it was, I guess, by by watching sort of television programs and things. That actually the real world was much more complex. It's sometimes it's not as uh, clean and pretty and blood free as it is often portrayed to be. Yeah, exactly. And and I I guess I guess the problem really was that I I had the the sort of beautiful fantasy illusion really that I would go to Africa and that we'd be driving down a sort of dirt road and that I, all I would see horizon to horizon would be uninterrupted wilderness which would be 
you know, loaded full of, of animals. And, and actually, uh, quite a lot of the time, we were driving down roads with lots of people. Uh, people are everywhere. Africa is, is uh, you know, the, birth, the birthplace of humanity. People have been there for a very long time. And and they're everywhere, of course. And, and people affect the landscape just as they do everywhere in the world. And and actually, most of what I saw were, were goats and cows. And, and, and that was really a, a wake-up call for me, that, that it wasn't quite how I thought it was. And then, yeah, go, going into this reserve in Zambia, which was – a very large property. I mean, these places are huge, you know, so a small place is 20 square miles, you know, this place was much bigger than that. And and realizing that that actually there was a fence around it, that they needed to manage it, that they needed to protect the animals, that they needed to provide employment for the people around there, that in fact, if the animals didn't provide an income for that land, they wouldn't be there. That was that was the real sort of, and, and they, th- yeah, it's very trite. They, they said a lot down in Southern Africa and it, it grates after a while actually, but it is nonetheless true. It it pays, it stays. And, and, and the reality is that if that wildlife couldn't provide the landowners with an income, then they would revert to a land use that did. And, and we can see that in Africa, but we can actually see it everywhere. I'm looking out of my window now at what used to be a farmer's field, and it now has a small housing estate on it. Now, that is a great shame for my view. It's a great benefit to people locally because it provides much needed housing. And the reality is for the landowner, that is a better land use financially, economically, than it was to farm it. We, we see this all around the world. And, and I, I guess that realization that actually the world wasn't quite how I thought it was, and the dawning of that was was really quite, a, and it came, of course, at an important time for me as well, because I was coming to the end of my PhD and things and sort of, I guess, maturing a little bit as a scientist. Um, that all sort of came together to, to give me this kind of, I guess, love of trying to unravel some of the complexities and the horrible gray areas that actually exist in the world. So from what you've just said there, does that mean that, or would you say that economics is one of the primary drivers of our ability to facilitate conservation? Yeah, and we would love to think it isn't. And it would yeah, be It doesn't sit very comfortably, if it, though. If it, if it wasn't. No, it doesn't. It sits really uncomfortably. And, and I, I, I rail really against the idea of giving nature of value. I, I don't like it from a sort of personal place um, because I I have been very privileged, I guess, in that I've grown up in in an environment where, you know, I could live in a nice safe house and I could interact with the natural world. My parents were very into all this sort of thing. We had a beautiful garden. I could go outside. You know, I, I have grown up, I guess, with an appreciation of nature from that very personal, very privileged perspective. Um, but but the reality is that that's not actually how it rolls out in the world. And, you know, in this country, lots of people are in that situation, but we still talk of ecosystem services. We talk, still talk about notional ideas of value, and we still talk about, you know, value often in economic terms. And, and you can see with, with HS2, for example, people are talking about, you know, what is the value of this woodland versus that woodland? And ultimately, when we're talking about value, we actually often come down to an economic value, even when we have higher intentions and aspirations. Actually, in lots of places in the world where there are expanding populations, in some cases where there are people who um, want to develop just as we are, there is there is a pressure, of course, to be thinking about things economically. And I think that is something we need to, um, I guess, embrace, maybe reluctantly embrace, but also understand that that is, that is the reality of things. And, and we, we, we can't shy away from that. This is a perfect lead-in to the conversation that's being had right now. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, I think today is the day that the last entries for the, the consultation from uh, to DEFRA for the trophy hunting potential ban closes. Yeah, that's right, yeah. uh, that is a, a very uncomfortable, very prickly, very controversial conversation to be having that very understandably, in my opinion, uh, it doesn't sit very well with a, with a lot of people. I understand that it's difficult to remove emotion from these conversations. And I guess one of the reasons and motivations for me getting you on here was uh, hoping to have a conversation that removes the emotion and just understands what's happening on the ground. Because I think one of the other things that we are, or one of the things that we are very guilty of doing is forgetting about the people in these places that we seem to want to facilitate change upon. Uh, so what is the reality on the ground as a, as a scientist, as you know, with regard to trophy hunting and what that allows or doesn't allow? Is it good? Is it bad? What do we understand? 
Yeah. Okay. So I guess first of all, you're you're absolutely right about the emotional side of it, and and I get just as annoyed and angry, in fact, as as as, as anyone else when I see some of the images and when I see some of the stories. But but you're right. We do also need to disentangle some of the facts from that. And I use the word facts quite. Um, deliberately there because currently in the media discourse about trophy hunting there is a tremendous amount of misinformation in fact i think it's fair to say that i haven't seen a media piece on trophy hunting in the last six weeks that hasn't contained substantial errors that are i think in some cases being fairly deliberately um, put out there in order to uh, campaign against this type of activity and, that, and that's something that I'm looking at with a number of other scientists and we're, we're looking at that so we can sort of park that to one side and, and look at what's actually happening on the ground and and the reality is that the trophy hunting or sustainable utilization using wildlife um, through hunting um, in order to gain an income and to protect habitat um, currently protects about and the Figures are difficult to pin down, but somewhere between 1.3 and 1.5 million square miles in southern and eastern Africa. So we're talking about a huge amount of land in Tanzania, in Mozambique, in Zimbabwe, in Zambia, in Botswana and Namibia. And within South Africa, where wildlife is predominantly actually on privately owned uh, hunting reserves, we're talking about a land area of about 20 million hectares, which is um, approximately 10 times the size of Kruger National Park, which is the largest of the and most famous of the national parks in South Africa. So just in southern and eastern Africa, including Tanzania, we are talking about a colossal area of land. I, I believe it's about the size of France, if not a bit bigger. I want to press pause on Adam's level-headed discussion for a moment to contrast with a conversation from Eduardo Conclaves, who started the campaign to ban trophy hunting. And as far as I can tell, although having held many positions in a lot of big-named organizations, it doesn't seem to have a background which would provide a grounding for scientific-based advice on management principles. As you will see here, most of this discussion is around a kind of emotional rhetoric. This extract came from an interview on Good Morning Britain. Yeah. I worked at WWF for many yeah, years, yeah, and I can yeah. say that, you know, one can say that if there were a well-managed uh, programme, it could have benefits. But actually, the evidence of that happening on the ground simply doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. What we have, though, is organisations like the Safari Club that actively encourages hunters to go and kill animals, many of them endangered. So they have schemes such as the Africa 29, which is to, where you have to go and get 29 different trophies. Yeah. The, the big cats of the world, the, think, the, the World Global People watching, uh, you know, will find it pretty astonishing. What I'm wondering is, if there is a financial contribution that these hunters make, is there not a possibility that our government can step in and just fill that gap? Because I can't believe it's that much, to be honest. It's well, it, it, it makes a tiny contribution, actually, to local yeah. communities. I mean, the, the, the fees from trophy hunting either tend to stay within the industry or in the hands of a small number of corrupt officials. The thing that does work and does bring prosperity to local communities is nature tourism, wildlife tourism. It, cre it creates 40 mm. times as much revenue. Leave the animals alive. Far. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we are going to come back to this interview, but only briefly. Here is Adam again explaining how economic drivers change land use, and he expands on the notion of photo tourism's ability to replace current hunting revenue. Um, and that land is is under threat uh, because there are other ways to use that land. Predominantly, in in terms of human use, we're, we're talking about agriculture. So, what we see in lots of places in Africa is that with Populations expanding and with people wanting development, we're seeing conversion of land that used to have wildlife into things like, well, cattle, um, crops. We're also seeing mining. We're seeing dams. We're seeing hydroelectric projects. We're seeing roads, airports, towns, cities, just as we see everywhere else in the world. Now, at the moment, for the land that we're talking about, regardless of some of the issues of trophy hunting, and there, there are some issues, um, and we can talk about those in a minute. Regardless of those issues, trophy hunting is the main player for protecting the land that, that I've just spoken about. Without trophy hunting, and, and I think this is an important thing to say, without an alternative to trophy hunting for that land, and ecotourism, unfortunately, is not a valid alternative for most of that land, without alternatives that land will slowly but inextricably and probably not that slowly actually once it happens become wildlife free and we've seen this happen so uh, kenya for example uh, banned hunting 40 years ago you're going to hear more about kenya but here's eduardo once again picking up a question from piers morgan we're going to dig into the botswana example he mentions but notice the failure to tackle the kenya question no, listen this helps it helps mm. save animals 
It'd be wonderful if it were true, but it's not. And if you look, for example, in Botswana, we talked about Botswana, they stopped trophy hunting there because the elephant populations were crashing. When they stopped trophy hunting, of course, the elephant populations recovered. Mm. And you look what at other Kenya? species... What um, about Kenya? Steve Sporting was about Well, there's Kenya so many different examples, banned. and there's been a lot of scientific studies. I mean, let's look at the... Yes, he is right. There have been a lot of studies, and over the rest of this year, I will be speaking to scientists involved in these to really get a true understanding of conservation mechanisms and the reality on the ground. So let's get back to Adam once and for all as he picks up the story of Kenya's hunting ban. Under pressure largely actually from Western NGOs um, and also because of the, the large amount of ivory poaching that was going on. So they banned all sports hunting. And what we've seen in Kenya is a reduction of around 70% of wildlife. Now, there are lots of factors that have contributed to that. But whenever you look at analyses of that decline, the hunting ban has come out as one of the issues because wildlife no longer had a value on the land. And so the land became more or less worthless for wildlife. And what we see is conversion into, into agriculture. And, you know, we've seen that uh, in Tanzania, for example, after Cecil the Lion. Uh, some of the concessions, the hunting areas there became much less attractive because America were not allowing the imports of lions um, uh, or lion trophies. And so people didn't bid for them. And, and not that long ago, about 12,000 square miles, or it might be square kilometers, I can't remember, of previous wildlife land was was put over to development. Um, this is what we're seeing. So that the real value of trophy hunting is actually not to provide income. Um, that is a value and it is very useful for the people involved. But really, from a conservation perspective, the real value is that it keeps that land, that habitat protected for wildlife rather than for other land uses. So my takeaway from that then is that it's vitally important that the local communities that live within these these ecosystems uh, with the environment that's around them and the wildlife that inhabits it actually have a, a buy-in and vested interest in keeping it there. So that kind of comes down to some form of property rights and, and ownership in some form, whether that be uh, through employment or through government communal concessions. Yeah, absolutely. When, when when your resource is the wildlife around you, you must be given some form of being able to make use of it. And you have to be involved with that. And, and that's what we see, actually. We see successful conservation around the world is with local buy and unsuccessful conservation tends to be more fortress conservation uh, where basically fences go out, people are excluded, and then you end up with big poaching problems. You end up with local people not being interested at all in conservation because why would they? You know, they're excluded from it. So that inclusionary approach is very important. And, and one of the things that we've seen developing in, in this whole trophy hunting debate actually is a rise of, of people, local people having more of a voice. That voice often it actually isn't particularly uh, picked up with, uh, picked up on by the media. Um, but we are seeing that voice coming through. And, and there was a letter in Science, the journal, for example, fairly recently, uh, that was signed by local community leaders from Botswana, Namibia, Zimbabwe, and Zambia, who were basically saying that these calls for from Western organizations to ban trophy hunting was, and I, I'm, I'm quoting from them, denying them their human rights. Effectively, it was excluding them from conservation, excluding them from, from gaining an income from their wildlife, which they are very successfully conserving, actually, currently, and, and in so doing was, was, was denying them that. And I think that's an important point to note as well. There was a, a survey uh, done last year a scientific paper that came out that was looking at conservation effort of megafauna, so large animals across the world. And four of the top five countries are countries that have enshrined within their conservation policy sustainable utilization of which trophy hunting is a part. So it's a really important point to make is that the countries that are most successful at conserving their wildlife are the countries that are doing the activities that some organizations and some people now want to ban. So it is a it is a very thorny issue really and, it, and it's one that, that calls into calls into play not just economics and sociology but but also the the notion of human rights and what you can what how you can restrict others around the world from from doing different activities. Beyond that, uh, and maybe if we turn our attention specifically to uh, the Botswana story, which has uh, been very relevant and in the press in the last couple of weeks with them reopening um, hunting, and in particular what's been making the papers is elephant hunting. And I, I think they've already auctioned off the first 60 of 200 plus um, elephants that they're, they're planning on, uh, on auctioning for hunting. 
Is there, I mean, part of their, their discussion is not only the benefit to local communities um, through funds and employment, but they actually have uh, a management issue with population densities of elephants in that, in that northern area of Botswana impacting the habitat that they actually live in along with all the other species that they share that habitat with. How do we how do we square that circle with regard to management? When I've had that discussion before, I've tried to liken it to things that people can understand, like our management of deer. But it's a very difficult discussion to have because an elephant is an elephant, and people view them in a very different manner, even though they are a four legged mammal that consume flora in a very similar manner. Yes, and, and Botswana is an interesting one actually because so um, but Botswana is often talked about as having a hunting ban. Actually, they did they didn't have a ban. They had a moratorium on hunting, um, which, as you say, they've lifted. Now that moratorium was was taken largely um, without public consultation. It was actually very unpopular. Um, they decided to lift that moratorium after a fairly long period of consultation, where the overwhelming um, decision of local people was that 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 hunting ban needed to be lifted. Um, lots of the concessions, which were previously so parcels of land that were previously hunting concessions, were supposed to be taken up by photographic tourism, and, and they weren't. And that that land was basically now we've seen an increase in poaching, for example, in Botswana during that period. So it didn't really work for a lot of the local people. I know um, Keith Somerville has, has, has noted that one community that he's involved with um, lost six hundred thousand dollars a year as a consequence of the hunting ban. You know that was what was paying for for education, for water, and so on. So the, the decision to lift that was wasn't taken lightly. And as you say, that the sort of centerpiece of that really has been elephants. I think you've you've been down to this area of Botswana actually, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. I spent some time in it last year, um, yeah. just after I came back from the Congo. So, I, I went mean, you, and drove you, through there, and you can see. I mean, I'm making I make this statement um, not on any kind of scientific basis, but just visually what i what i could see and having seen habitat impact from other species in other parts of the world and to me it was very obvious bearing in mind at that time there had been no rain really for i don't know like nine ten months uh so they were concentrated in a smaller and smaller area but the actual impact um to the habitat there was i mean it, it almost looked apocalyptic it was it was quite something i'd never really seen elephant damage like that uh, in my life, no, and and I was down there in November, um, down on the sort of southern eastern part of of the, the Okavango Delta, and I, I was expecting to see some elephant damage, but nothing prepares you actually for what you see. Uh, photographs don't do it justice because you don't get that landscape sense. And you're right, apocalyptic is precisely the word. Trees down everywhere, um, the landscape very heavily altered. Now, elephants have always done that, and elephants are. Um, ecosystem engineers in that sense however they are at artificially high densities now or unnaturally high densities because of course human changes to the landscape prevent them from moving around as much as uh, as they would normally um humans have always been or not always but have recently been a fairly large factor in, in elephants potentially um and and that sort of changes as well so what we have in botswana is a population of well, anywhere between 130,000 and depending on the time of year, um, over 200,000 elephants that, that move through that area. The carrying capacity of that area is a highly disputed figure. However, um, I have never seen a figure higher than 50,000 and I've seen figures lower than 30,000 before. So there is really no doubt, and, and I haven't seen anyone argue convincingly that this isn't the case, that elephants are well above the capacity of the environment to handle them. When you see firsthand the damage that they cause, there's clearly some cause for worry. Um, trophy hunting is never going to get on top of those um, numbers. The, the, yeah, the only way you could actually get out, on top actually. of those numbers. Yeah, and it was never intended to. And what happens is, of course, a lot of people pick up on this. That You're right. I mean, everyone loves elephants. Um, people pick up on this and they say, no, leave the elephants alone. Um, trophy hunting, you know, you're going to kill all these elephants. You're never going to do it. Tro trophy hunting was never intended to do that. Actually, trophy hunting was intended to provide some incentive for local people to put up with the damage and crop damage particularly, but also um, human lives that are taken as a consequence of, of elephants. And I've seen um, numbers of up to 35 last year were killed. Now, now, what's interesting is that people that are very, very against the um, trophy hunting of elephants in Botswana, um, I've seen them say, this is rubbish. The Botswana government are making this up. Um, only 17 people were killed. 
um, and, I, and I sort of stand back <laughs> and think, oh, unbelievable. Yeah. Um, okay, so it, it is, and, I, and I think the problem is until you've actually been on the ground and maybe spoken to some of the local people there and made an attempt to stand in their shoes and understood what it might be like to have a herd of elephants come through and destroy your year's crop and, and potentially kill your family from starvation. I think it's very difficult to make those judgments. And I, I did a series of interviews actually following Cecil the Lion, a series of interviews about lion hunting. And I was interviewing some people that lived around the outside of the Peenensberg National Park in South Africa, which has a very large fence around it. And I, I was trying to basically get people to say they were scared of lions. Um, they weren't scared of lions. The, the thing they were scared of was elephants. The, that was what they were worried about because of the damage that they cause. So it, it, is, a, it is a very tricky thing. There, there is no way to reduce the numbers of, of elephants in Botswana um, other than by undertaking a culling program, which would be beyond probably any current means and beyond our, um, I, I think, no one would w wish to embark on that. Um, it, would, it would involve the killing of tens of thousands of elephants. And I know some people um, back that and some conservationists have mentioned it before. Uh, I don't think that's something that, that's even worth discussing. That, that simply won't happen. But the trophy hunting of, of elephants, about 230, I think, 250, I can't remember the exact number was the total number. Um, th that is really there to, to try and alleviate some of the um, some of the problems that, that are being caused by elephants in terms of allowing local people to get buy-in and to get some money from them. Um, they've very successfully auctioned off the first two packages now of those. I can't remember the exact numbers, but 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 that's that's continuing. And actually, the Botswana government released a media statement, um, rather interestingly, uh, on Sunday. So we're doing this on Tuesday. And towards the end of it, I've got it in front of me, actually, because I'm giving a talk on this uh, tomorrow, it says the department has received letters by anti-hunting non-governmental organizations, NGOs, and photo tourism operators claiming the qualifying criteria for the special elephant quota auction and tenders are exclusive and inappropriate. So they're saying that they can't bid for them because they're only for hunting. Um, all such claims are clearly promoting a special interest agenda and are not in the, least and are not in the best interest of community livelihoods and wildlife conservation. A restrictive qualifying criterion protects the sector from those seeking to undermine and disrupt the controlled hunting program. Moreover, a restrictive qualifying criterion promotes the greatest benefits being generated to communities on marginal lands, so basically places that no one wants to go and visit. Those promoting these mistaken claims are reminded that they had the opportunity to acquire the rights to these areas following the implementation of the hunting moratorium. However, they did not take advantage of the opportunity at that time. So what that's saying is that there are a number of, of NGOs, and, and they're quite active on Twitter, who have um, in the last week or so um, tried to buy these elephants to save them from the hunter's bullet. Um, and they've made quite a big fuss about it, and they weren't allowed to because they weren't a qualifying organisation. And they've said, "Well, this isn't fair," you know, blah blah blah. Actually, they had plenty of opportunity to do that over the last five years. One of the reasons why the hunting moratorium was lifted was because organisations did not take up the opportunity of photo tourism. And and we see this kind of line coming out of Botswana, and I see it increasingly coming out of Namibia now, which is basically accusing Western, particularly Western NGOs of interfering and dabbling in, in the conservation in their area. And they are getting very, very annoyed about it. And they are calling it out in some cases as racism. They're calling it out in, in some cases as, as sort of privileged dabbling. And you can sense from the line that's coming out that there is a lack of patience now. Um, with this, you know, they, they want to be able to manage the land themselves. And it's worth noting that in that that survey of megafauna conservation I mentioned earlier, top country, head and shoulders above everyone else, Botswana. You know, they know what they're doing and they're doing it very well. And as you've seen firsthand, they have problems and they need to be able to deal with those problems. Just as a, maybe as a way of wrapping this up, because one of the, the discussions that comes up as the counter to this is, well, why can't we just have more parks? Why can't we just have more national parks across the continent of Africa, like, like Kruger or um, like Addo, where the animals there are protected and no hunting really takes place. One of the yeah, I mean, and what, what, that what, would be great, I, wouldn't it? One of the things I'd maybe like you to, to expand upon in that is is conservation in the very long term, I'm not just talking about like five years, I'm talking 100, 200 years time, is that really um, a sustainable view if we are uh, accepting the fact that these parks or areas or however you want to define them are continually funded by 
donations of NGOs rather than a viable economic interest? Yeah, I, I think one of the biggest problems that we we face at the moment is that none of these models are, are really long term sustainable. Um, so, national parks, for example, um, I was 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 hearing about some of the national parks in Tanzania. They they're uh, um, they're not self sustaining. Um, most of these parks rely on on input from from others. The Africa Parks model is very successful, but it has a huge amount of money behind it, um, and they are acquiring more land. But of course, the land that that is acquired for national parks has very often people living in it and, and people that have lived there for a very long time and, and have cultural and, and sort of historical associations with that land. Um, they're very often forcibly removed in some cases. And we're seeing the problems that the World Wildlife Fund, for example, are having at the moment with accusations of torture, rape, murder, um, with the exclusion of local people from, from parks within um, sort of Central Africa. Uh, the Peelensburg National Park, I mentioned it earlier, uh, when you walk around that on foot, which, I, which I've been privileged enough to be able to do, uh, you come across all these weird sort of buildings and low walls and stuff. That was a, a town that was basically evacuated and fenced off and the whole area was then converted to wildlife. These sorts of exclusionary sort of fortress conservation models. Um, don't necessarily work when you've got people involved or you have to include those people and their traditions and heritage and cultural traditions in, in ways that, that are acceptable. Um, so that, that's one problem. Of course, we're, we're talking about hunting as a, as a sort of model. Let's be very clear about it. In 50 to 100 years time, is this going to be a, a, a model that we want or that is that is long term sustainable. I, I doubt either is going to be true. We're seeing already uh, problems in America with reduction in hunting um, revenues, causing knock on effects for conservation. Overall, um, in fifty to one hundred years' time, are the generation growing through now? Are we going to get people willing to go and spend fifty thousand pounds to go and hunt an elephant or a lion? It's it's. I'm sure there will be some people, but but overall, you know, that sort of model is not necessarily going to work either. Um, making people dependent on Western NGOs for handouts in order to conserve their wildlife doesn't feel to me like a morally good way to go, but it also doesn't feel like a sustainable way to go either. Um, so all of these problems are, are in place. And, and one of, yeah, my position about trophy hunting is very simple. I would be very happy if it went tomorrow. The reality is if it goes tomorrow and lots of people call for immediate bans, if that happens, we have a big, big problem for all of the land that's currently protected by it. We need to find solutions. Yes, we should look to phase out trophy hunting because it relies on overseas money. It relies on the motivations and, and sort of hobbies, let's put it, let's put it that way, of, of people that live a long way away. We should look for better solutions, and people are. But currently, we don't have many players in, in, in the game to, to, um, to replace it. So overall, you're absolutely right. We, we need to find better models. I mean, what, one way to do it would be sort of a, an international fund. You know, we all pay a penny a year extra in tax and it supplies enough money across the world to, to keep our wildlife safe. You know, we, 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 you know, there are ways we can do it. But as with many of the problems that we're facing in the world today, we need to take a step back and we need to, we need to come up with better, more internationally inclusive models. And I, I think I kind of like in our... our our sort of development to, you know, uh, the developing child, I think we think of ourselves as adults, but actually we're kind of not. We're sort of pre-adults, I think. I think we, we've gone through the stage where we're basically doing whatever we want and we're suddenly wising up to the fact, you know, maybe we're teenagers, we're suddenly wising up to the fact that the world's a bit more complex than we thought, that maybe we need to modify our behavior. And at some point we need to enter into maturity and, and take responsibility. And, and I think we're seeing it with climate change, we're seeing it with um, consumption and sort of politics, although we're a long way from the end game there. Um, but we're certainly starting to see that, yeah, a very long way. We're st certainly starting to see that emerging in terms of conservation because we're starting to realize, I think, that, well, hang on, you know, me giving eight pounds a, a month to this charity that claims to help elephants is actually just funding an orphanage that doesn't help any wild habitat. You know, me, uh, you know, let's let's imagine I had either the money, time or inclination, me spending £20,000 to go and kill a lion somewhere and have its head on my wall. Well, you know, is that going to be the case in 50 years time? We're starting to realise that, that we need new ways of doing things. And there was a fabulous report actually that came out not very long ago by the Luke Hoffman Institute, which looked at 130 different types of, of community conservation models. 
And its conclusion was that at the moment, we don't have anything that's going to replace hunting and tourism. Those are the two main players. And that tourism isn't a panacea, um, that, that really there's still problems. But what was great reading through that report was that there were 130 different models and they were all working somewhere. The issue is scaling them up or transferring them. But what we need to do is to keep working to find those replacements. In the meantime, we have to acknowledge the fact, whether we like it or not, that trophy hunting is currently protecting habitat. I can't find, and I'm very open to be challenged on this, and I really hope that someone can, I cannot find a species that is currently under threat from trophy hunting specifically. Um, but I can find lots of species on the IUCN um, data books that have trophy hunting as part of their recognized conservation program that's put down by the expert panel that are experts in, in that in the conservation of that group. So we, we have to be a bit mature about it. We have to understand that there are sometimes things that, that, that we don't like. We have to work at more sustainable ways to replace them, but we cannot afford to throw the baby out with the bathwater at this stage. We, we're going to cause problems for, for biodiversity. I, I really do believe that. Yeah, I, I think there's two things, really. I think the first one is that the UK, we, we should be leading the charge to find better ways globally to conserve habitat and wildlife. We should be leading that charge. We shouldn't be leading the charge by making fairly cheap, quick political capital out of populist bans that are called for, I think, in many cases by people that are either motivated purely by their emotional response to animals, or I suspect in many cases actually don't understand the issues fully that they're, that they're they're backing. I think that's the first thing. But you know, we should be really we, we should take this as an opportunity to say, right, we don't like this. Let's find better solutions. Let's manage its phasing out. Let's help the world do it better. Maybe that can be our role, our post-Brexit role in the world. You know, we could finally we could finally find that role, right? We we could lead the charge in global conservation. That feels like something that we should and could do. But in the short term, I, I would say to anyone on that panel, you know. The IUCN is the world's leading conservation organization. They are the people that define whether an animal is endangered or not. They, their red list is really defining global conservation. They support regulated trophy hunting as a means to preserve habitat. If you dig down into the IUCN red list and you look at the conservation actions of a large number of species, you find trophy hunting listed often primarily as the means to conserve that animal currently in the wild. Those conservation actions are detailed by the world's conservation experts on that group. When you look at megafauna conservation areas around the world, the most successful countries are those that incorporate hunting within their strategy. So what I would say to people on that panel is, if you decide that you're going to enact bans that go against that, that is a very bold move that suggests that you have evidence that trumps the evidence of the IUCN and of the expert groups that co contribute to those plans. And I think if you have that evidence, you have to make it public. You need to make representations to those panels. You need to present that evidence because so far, I haven't seen that evidence. You know, I've seen lots of evidence that, that support it. I've seen lots of evidence of problems with it and ill regulation. And obviously, if we don't regulate it properly and we don't have regular quotas and, and it's done badly, it can cause problems. We're talking about a very complex activity across a very complex suite of species in many different habitats and regions across the world. You know, you, you can't have a one size fits all. But I, I would say that to the to the panel is that that it would be a very bold step indeed, I think, to 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 go against that recommendation. And I think that's something that needs to be thought through carefully. You know, this is this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to do things differently, but but we have to be mindful of how we go about doing it. Um, we, we've seen all sorts of unintended consequences with, with bans already. Um, uh, the ban on, on lions, for example, has caused some problems in Tanzania. We, the ban on polar bears that was enacted by the USA as a populist move um, actually caused all sorts of economic issues for people living in Nunavut who were relying on polar bear trophy hunting fees for income, but also uh, disenfranchised many of those people from the conservation process. So we already know what happens when this, when this goes through. So we just, we need to be careful, but now is the time for us to lead the charge, I think. 
Adam, thank you very much for your time today. It's much appreciated, and your your level-headed, sort of prag pragmatic viewpoints are, are ones that I hope that will, people will listen to. Thank you. No, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for listening to the show. Join me again in a week's time when we take another walk into the wilderness.